Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to actually set up Debian. Ideally, you have downloaded Debian um, in your environment. Don't judge. Ideally, you've downloaded the latest one. For me, when I download this software, just because it's easier to manage my files, what I like to do is to put it onto my spindle-based storage media. You, of course, can do whatever you want. As you can see, I've got a lot of stuff downloaded in my InfoSec demos. But you should have Debian downloaded. Now, you're going to see Kali there, and your instinct is to download and play with Kali. By all means, feel free to engage in that. But I'm not 100% sure that this is the Kali we're going to use. So don't install this expecting that that'll be the Kali that we use going forward. But that's the Kali I'm looking at to use this semester. Okay? At the end of the day, um, I have a Debian 1070 and the AMD64. And it's also the net install, but that's pretty default. These It's rare you download a complete DVD with all the content on it. Just because we're using such a small subset, it doesn't really matter. We're not setting up the X Windows interface. We're setting up the tools we need as we deploy them, and that'll make sense as we go along. I don't want to install a bunch of extra stuff in Debian that I'm never going to use. All right? When we set up Debian, we're going to set a very small set of components, and then we are going to add only what we need. Setting up Debian, having um, the graphical interface, even XFCE, installs a bunch of unnecessary software onto our server. All of that software can be open for exploitation in the future, as we'll see when we're doing our pen testing. It is always better to harden systems before you deploy it. To help that, to help that hardening process, don't install anything that you don't specifically need. Okay? And that's what we're going to do with this. So we're going to do a very basic install and only add the components that we want. I have downloaded the Debian AMD64 net install, so I'm going to now go ahead and create a new virtual machine. I also have Oracle VM install, installed. The process to install is very straightforward. The defaults are fine. Click on New. And one thing I like about the Debian um, correction, the virtual box setup, is that just by simply typing in Deb, I get, oh, you probably want to set up a 64-bit version of Debian Linux, which is exactly what I want to do, of course. Now, you guys are section two, so I'm going to type in Debian. I'm going to call it Debian bit section two, only because... I use this a lot, and I need to have different Debians for different classes, okay? You can call it whatever you want. One gig is probably enough. Two gig is not um, a bad idea. We are going to be getting into some password cracking very soon, and being able to bump up the memory is going to be beneficial. Um, four gig is probably overkill. One gig is probably fine, okay? If you have it, give yourself 2 gig. Um, the password cracking that we are doing is not resource demanding. I'm going to set it up so it's fairly straightforward and easy to handle. Click on Next. We can create a virtual disk. VDI is the default image type for VirtualBox. Dynamic is better. It'll grow to the size we need. And we're going to set it to 8 gig. We'll probably use less than a gig of drive space. Allowing it to be 8 gig is ideal. Um, especially if you're going to set it up on your um, solid-state drive, all right, which is what I'm doing. My C drive is my solid-state drive, much faster, and I don't want to waste a bunch of space. Now, I went through in preparation for today's class, and I freed up a bunch of drive space so that it wouldn't be a problem this semester but I don't want to needlessly waste drive space, so I'm dynamically allocating, and 8 gig is lots. At that point, you can click on Create, and at that point, it... Um, yeah, don't worry about that. At that point, it will create the virtual machine. It'll create the hard drive, and when we go into it, it shows that it is an 8 gig drive, but when we take a look at storage, 
and actually select it'll show you real world how big it is and that's probably the size of my um, sector sizes or my cluster sizes whatever you want to call them on my hard drive so it's as small as it can be right now all right we're going to come back to that you may have noticed that i've got a couple of uh, groups here the easiest way to create groups is to right click on a vm and assign it to a group you don't have to do this of course you don't like the group name right click and rename group and I'm going to call this bit websec. And now I've got a group for my VMs. Of course, you don't need to do this, um, but you'll see as I go through the semester, I use this a lot. And I just deleted probably 10 VMs from last semester, and that wasn't even a, a VM intense semester. I use this a lot. I go through a lot of VMs in this, and I have to say it's pretty good at managing your VMs and allowing you to group content together. Okay, so I've got my Debian VM set up. Let's go and finalize the configuration. Are there any questions? Let's move on. You can select this, right click and select settings. You can select it, click on things, or you can actually click on the name of each of the categories of settings, it's actually like hot linked into the configuration for that. For example, I can click on the word system, it'll take me into system, and I can adjust the amount of memory or the number of processor cores I give to this. That setting should be fine. The display can be adjusted. We're not going to change this. We're only going to do this in command line, so we don't need a lot of display resources. Again, that should be fine. When it comes to the storage, however, we are going to want to modify this. We already have our hard drive defined. We need to def add the ISO that we downloaded. So what I want you to do is to click on the word empty all the way to the right side. Click on the little icon that looks like a C an optical drive. And there is a download. And you can use the wizard to create it, or you can choose a disk file. Please select choose disk file. Navigate through your file system to wherever it is that you've got your downloads. As you can see, I use this a lot, and select Open. That will give you your installation media attached to your controller. Okay? Some of you may say, hey, you know what? There are um, OVA files you can download that are Debian up and ready to go. And to be honest, that is fine. And to be honest, when we start looking at attacking virtual machines, we are going to use those OVA files and import them into VirtualBox. But I refer back earlier to my earlier comment that we want to ensure we only install what we need for our environment as part of the pre-hardening process. By going through the installing wizard, we limit what gets installed. We limit risk by limiting what gets installed. All right, so I've specified my install media. Don't have to worry about audio. You can even disable it if you want. The next thing I want to take a look at is the network. You should have one adapter set to NAT. That's fine. When we do our installation, the first adapter is going to go out to the internet and download the necessary files. When we add the components we want to add, we're going to use this adapter to communicate with the internet. Adapter two, however, we also want to enable. This is going to go on a separate environment. In this case, it's going to be our host only. Now, I can't zoom in, so you're going to have to zoom if you want to see what's going on. Control and mouse wheel will allow you to zoom in and zoom out. Okay? You should only have one virtual box network. If you have multiple, select one that is consistent. We'll come back to this in a sec. Okay? And then advanced. We want to change the promiscuous mode to allow all. This allows virtual machines to communicate with each other easily and allows you to talk to the virtual machine from the host environment down easily as well. It assumes or it allows communication all around pretty easily. All right. Adapter 1, NAT, no advanced settings. Adapter 2, host only. Specify the default host only network if you have multiples. We'll talk about that in a sec. I'm going to just use one. I'm not going to use the second one. And then promiscuous mode, allow all. 
the rest of the settings should be fine. Do not disable USB. That is how your uh, mouse and keyboard interact with the environment, and you're going to want both for this class. Shared folders, nothing really there. And user interface, you can tweak this if you want. Don't worry about it. Okay. The big thing is, is adding a separate adapter to our environment and connecting it to the host-only network and promiscuous mode allow all. And the other big thing is adding the UAB correction, the um, installation ISO file. You can then click on OK. Any questions? Yeah, I don't have a virtual box, like under the name box there for network. It doesn't actually, look, just says not selected and no option. Share your desktop, anything. please. Sure, hold on one sec. Give me one sec. Got to hide all the gaming stuff you're yeah, playing? Yeah. Pretty much. Okay, so show me VirtualBox. One sec. Okay, so um, click on Cancel. And uh, stop sharing. And I'm going to start sharing again. We're going to talk about that right now. If you have the problem that um, I think it was Jared had. What's going on is that your host-only network environment is not configured 100%. So let's take a look at that. Under File, we have a Host Network Manager. You can also get there by hitting Control H. In the Host Network Manager, you should see a host-only network. I'm guessing, Jared, you do not. If you do not have one, you can click on the Create button and go through the process of creating a host-only network. It will pop up this warning. I don't know if you can still see this, but you get a warning saying, hey, Oracle wants to change your settings. Are you sure you want to allow that? Click on Yes, and it will add a host-only network to your environment. This can require you restarting Windows, so just keep that in mind. But as you can see, I've got a third one now. And the network I have is 191. We're not done. All right. You also have to set up DHCP. You can enable it here. You can go to the DHCP server and then you can make your settings. Okay. When it comes to a DHCP server, there's a couple of things. The network address has to mark match. My network address for my adapter is 191. My server and lower and upper ranges half match as well. I don't think you should use two. I think you should use 100 as a server address and then go 101 to 254, which is the default that you get. All right. So you have to do those sets, click on apply, and then you may need to start Jared. You may need to restart at that point. But once you've done that, um, you should have your host-only network set up, okay? For me, I want to use host-only network. The first one, and it's 56.1 is the network. And then 50.101, 56.254, 56.1, and that's it. This one I really should remove, but I'm going to leave it there just to explain, okay? It is possible to have multiple host-only networks, Pick one and use it. If you only want one, you can delete the other one. All right. Again, once you've done that, then you can go in, go to your adapter, and then specify that. If it's still not there, Jared, restart your computer and try again. Okay? It's there. I'm on the superior ah, Mac platform. There's your problem. Something else, Jared, point out, um, and I'm going to recreate this problem now. I don't know if you can see this, but I went into my USB, and don't do this, just I'm using this as an ex example. At the bottom of your dialog box, if you see invalid settings detect, you can put your mouse on top, and it'll actually tell you where the problem is. Go in and fix that, okay? Unless I want to go through and play with the extension, the extension pack, or extension pack, I should say, I'm going to have a problem with this setting. So I'm going to go back and make sure that my settings make sense. 
Sometimes we just see this when we port a VM and it's using the wrong graphics adapter. Move on top and it says, hey, you should use a different graphics adapter. Don't always agree with it. We're going to see in the future, we need to leave it as a legacy video display because that's the display that was set up when the VM was first set up. Understand it and address it. And sometimes addressing it means ignoring it. Okay. VMS VGA is probably the better one that we can set up. The VBox SVGA is also an option that does really well, but again, VirtualBox doesn't like it. It keeps telling us, you know what, just use the VM Virtual Machine Super VGA um, display adapter. And that seems to work with most modern VMs. We do use some legacy VMs, so sometimes you don't want to change that, but always address any alerts of invalid settings in your VM. Okay? Any other questions? Perfect. At this point, you should have Debian ready to go. You can then click on the Start button. If you see something like this, just in the drop-down, make sure you select the correct virtual machine. Newer versions of VirtualBox don't do this. I have an older version, so sometimes when it powers up, I have to actually go in and say, no, this is the ISO I want to install in. I actually think it's, or install from. I actually think it's a bit of a bug. I like have just so I can address it with anybody else. Hopefully you won't see that. Select it if it pops up and then click on start. We want to use the graphic install, but we haven't loaded anything graphical yet. When you go to double click, it simply doesn't work. So you need to hit enter. And then after a while, you can see my mouse is outside. After a while, it will load the graphical tools and it'll allow us to use our mouse. I'm using the scroll on my mouse. So again, how did I do that? After I went through the settings, I started my virtual machine. And the option we want to select is graphic install, just hit enter. You can do a command line install, um, but I'm going to suggest you do a graphic install. Okay. It's just, it's a little easier. It gives us a point and click environment and it'll match the videos going forward. All right. Once the graphic install has started up, then you do some basic configurations for the graphical environment. The first is language. English is fine. It wants to know where you're installing from. I would recommend selecting Canada. You hit C on the keyboard and right away it scrolls up to Canada for you. Hit enter at that point and then you are going forward. Now, the language and the keyboard, you can use other languages if you prefer, but I advise against it. Not because there's anything wrong with using other languages, of course. The issue is, is that Developers don't often incorporate language pack considerations when they release software. And sometimes it breaks software because the language pack that you have selected isn't supported in the software that you want to install. It's unfortunate, but it is a truth software that we have available to us. Not only open source, but commercial software sometimes fails to properly load languages. As a general rule, I always advise my students to use American English keyboard and language just to make things easier for them, okay? Even if you have a French keyboard for this, you're probably going to be okay with the American English keyboard. Hit enter or click on continue. At this time, it's going to go through the ISO which is at this point, it considers it to be an actual CD-ROM and it's going to start retrieving files. It's not installing anything yet. Everything it is doing at this point, it's doing it to a file system that it has in memory. This is not the file system that will be, that is the hard drive. That's going shortly. At this point, it's just running a file system in memory. Is everybody at this point where you need to select a network adapter? Are there any questions? No? What's up, Jared? Other than you're using no. a Mac. Okay. Mine aborts. <laughs> Mine really? aborts the moment okay. I click the graphical uh, um, install. So uh, yeah. try the VBox SVGA adapter in your settings and try again. And if that doesn't work, try one of the other graphic displays and try okay. again. Okay? 
Got it. We'll do. Oh. Also, did you install VirtualBox tools for There's Mac? Like a separate package that should to only install. really be necessary. No, just in general, I always yeah, just install but, it with VirtualBox. It just okay. allows extra features. Be. That Maybe I don't Mac know. Just um, wants I've that. never had to do that VirtualBox working. And first of all, Jeremy, thank you. I appreciate the contributions. Thank you. Um, I've never had to do that to get VirtualBox working on a Mac. And often those tools help VMs more than they help the host environment. But again, I haven't played with them in a long time. So I could be mistaken on that. But those are both good ideas to look at, Jared. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. Yeah, on okay. a Mac. I appreciate it. For me, it thank so you. Just figured I'd Max, mention. what's with all the Macs? It's way too cool for computer geeks, in my opinion, but nevertheless. Um, yeah. You know, it's you have, Linux a, with you have a closer to Linux point. than and Windows. And to be honest, I use Macs a lot in my, in my home, so I kind of get it. I really do. Um, I just like teasing people who use Macs because there's no end in problems with VirtualBox and Macs, and I have to play games too. Um, regardless, is everybody else? Jared, I'll let you get caught up, and if not, we'll take it offline. You can follow along, and we'll take it up later on. Um, perfect. Perfect. So I'm at this up. point, we set up two network adapters. One was NAT. The other one was our host-only network. Depending on how you set it up in your environment, the first adapter is going to be ENP0S3. The second adapter is going to be ENP0S8. You Mac users might see something a little different, but I think it should be more or less the same. At that point, you want to select the first one because, as I said before, that's the one that's giving you access to the Internet. That's the one that's just going to set the IP address 10.0.2.15. It's just going to go straight through and download stuff off the internet. Select ENP0S3. If your setting is the same as mine, and click on continue. And it wants a name. Now, I always give my machines very short names. I could leave it at Debian, but I prefer three letters, Deb, okay? Only because the few, fewer characters you use, the shorter the prompt is going to be in Debian. It's not going to apply as Kali when we set up Kali later on. But right now, the prompt that we use, especially because we're doing everything command line, it will be helpful for us to have short usernames and machine names. I prefer Deb. You can call your machine whatever you want. You do not have to use a network name. Everything we do in this class is going to be IP-based, so there is no machine naming or network naming requirements. I, as a throwback to one of the instructors we lost a few years ago, I always use opsys.bit as my domain name. You do not have to. We had an instructor who used to teach Linux, and that was the name he used to use for the network configuration in all of our Linux configurations. He's no longer with us, and it's just a little tilt of the hat to him. So I just used the domain opsys.bit. It doesn't matter. You can call it Charlie Brown's Kite Eating Tree, which is a variable name my high school math and computer teacher used to use. All right. We have another conversation about passwords yet. Um, you have in the past in your information... Um, systems course had the conversation around passwords you should not use easy to guess passwords and you should not reuse passwords especially in a single system i am however going to say this is a development environment and you need to make your life as easy as possible this is one of those do as i say not as i do moments recognizing that yeah we're doing a production setup mindset but we're also using it in class we need to make our life as easy as possible I use the ultra, ultra secure password of password for these. This is the only environment that I do it. And click on continue. Okay? Whatever you type in, please remember it. I can do a lot of hacking on your system, but I cannot really mess around with the root password, especially in Debian. Some of the systems we hack, yeah, we can get in there and mess with the root password. Not in Debian, not easily. Okay? We want to create a new user. I just create the user, full username as the user ID I'm going to use. Again, I keep it short 
to keep my prompt short. It recommends the username as the same. And then again, we want a password. In this case, I use another password, but you can use the same one. I actually encourage you to say, use the same one. I'm using a different one. So when we get into password cracking in a couple of weeks, you'll see um, it doesn't really matter what encryption you use to hash your passwords. A crappy password is a crappy password. And that's one of the reasons I'm using crappy passwords is that you can see that it doesn't matter if you use the highest level of encryption. If you use a crappy password, it will be cracked. Most things in security are layered. Having good encryption is important, but it's just one layer in the overall protection process. All right. So I've set up a new user. I've given that new user a password. And now I need to select a time zone because I specified Canada. It lists the Canadian time zones. Click on continue. And now we're going to set up the file system. Before I said we were doing everything in a RAM disk, in a, a disk in memory. Now we're going to create real, as far as the operating system is concerned, partition and start writing files to it. You can do it manual, but for our purposes, we're going to use the guided process and it's just going to be default. Guided, use entire disk, default, continue. It's going to find the hard drive that we have, default, continue. It's going to say put everything on one partition. For what we're doing in this class, that's fine. Default, continue. It says this is what we're going to do. Are you, you want to do this? Default, continue. It's on this one. It says if you continue, these changes will be written to your desk. At this point, the installer thinks that you are going to fundamentally change the hard drive of your computer. It is not a hard drive, it is a file acting like a hard drive in a virtual computer inside a virtualized environment. The installer doesn't know that necessarily just yet. So it's saying, are you sure you want to make these changes? And now you actually have to say, yes, I want to blow away my old partition and create a new one. The old partition isn't there and it's a file, not a partition. Click yes and click on continue. And now it's created the partitions it set up the file system in that partition, and now it is installing a bunch of files. Now it is actually going, and we're still using a RAM disk, but it's actually creating a disk for booting in the future. Is everybody at this point, and are there any questions? I think, okay, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, I'm what's there. up, Jared? As per usual, I have an error. The D-Bootstrap program exited with an error return value 1. What point did you see one. that? Okay. At the um, point that you're at right you now. You might need when to take it and create a different controller. You know what? Take Jeremy's recommendation and try and install the extra tools and see if that doesn't address the issues. Okay, Jared? Jeremy, if you could post a link to the tools you were talking about in the chat so yep. others can see it as well. Thank you. You don't have to upload it, just show the link on VirtualBox. Because sure. on the VirtualBox website, I think I know what you're talking about, but I'd rather you post the link uh, yourself because that seems to be working for you and that's what Jared needs. Okay. Um, while Jeremy and Jared are doing that, we're going to talk about what's going on here. Um, historically, for when I first started playing with Linux back in the 90s, everything used to come on a CD. Thanks, Jeremy. Everything used to come on a CD, and you would just install everything, and it was only after many, many years did you start seeing... <laughs> nice touch. Um, it's only after a while you started seeing network repositories of software, just because Internet... You know, moving data on the internet was still prohibitively expensive back then, and now it's the norm. You want to set up any kind of Linux, chances are you do a very basic install, and then you pull everything off the internet, okay? This is a throwback to the old days when you used to do stuff off of a CD-ROM. It also allows for air gapping as well. This setup allows you to download the entirety of Debian 
do your uh, integrity tech checks using MD5 or SHA hash generations to ensure that the files haven't been manipulated in transit, take those, move them into a, an air-gapped environment, and install at that point. For our purposes, we do not want to use another CD or DVD. We want to download the next content from the internet. So default, default, and please select either deb.debian.org or I would recommend selecting ftp.ca.debian.org. I advise against using the other Canadian mirrors. We've done this in the past, and it has, you know, after one or two classes doing it, the mirror all of a sudden disappears because we overwhelm it. So use one of the Debian, actual Debian.org domain-based mirrors. I say ftp.ca.debian.org. You do you. The deb.debian.org might be a little more secure, but for what we're doing, this is fine. Select ftp.ca.debian.org and click on continue. It is unlikely you have any proxy considerations in your environment. If you do, you understand them and you can add them now. I do not. On the college proper, we do not. And chances are in your homes, you do not. Click continue. And if it is retrieving files, configuring up, pulling stuff from the cloud, and you can see in your status bar, there's red and green where it's querying and then receiving data. The status bar in Debian is extremely helpful. It shows us hard drive IO and network traffic. And as you move your mouse around, it even shows USB activity as well. Remember earlier I said we need USB. So if you're unsure if anything is happening, check the status bar of your virtual machine. I am downloading files, and we should be at this point shortly. Is everybody at this point except Jared? Are there any questions? Thank you. All right. Now, I suggest saying That's, no to yep. this, but you can do whatever you want. The activities we do in this class I would hate for them to skew the default configuration of Debian. This popularity contest takes a look at what you do and it decides what should be in the basic set of tools that they, that they deploy for Debian. And that is a great system and I trust the folks at Debian to do this properly. I don't think we, with what we're doing in this class, should be skewing those results. So I always advise people to say no and click on continue. Of course, you can do whatever you want. It just sends a little anonymous data out to uh, the Debian servers. I think it's called Popcorn or something like that. And, um, and that's fine. I have no problems with that. Okay. At some point, you're going to get to a point where you can specify software you want to install. Is everybody at this point? Okay. Anybody not at this point, I should be asking. Okay. Yeah. Clear everything. Go ahead, Jared. Yeah, I got Mark. Marcus. I, okay, where are you I now? I fell behind. Yeah, I've, I've, um, well, I, my internet was cutting out when you were going through some stuff. I'm currently, okay. uh, you, I just finished setting up a disk, so now it's installing okay. a base system. If you have any problems, but let I'll me be know, Marcus, I'm, I'm and we'll stop and address okay. them one at a time. Up. Same with you, Jared. If you have any problems and you need, you have a question, hesitate to interrupt, okay? Clear everything on the software selection except for the bottom two. We're not setting up a graphical environment. We will be setting up a web server, but we're going to set up what we want. We want an SSH server and the standard system utilities. Clear all the checkboxes except for the bottom two, and I want those two checked. We are going to, in the future, set up an SSH connection using PuTTY, and we are going to deploy our websites using WinSCP. So we need an SSH server running on Debian. We also want the standard system utilities um, to be deployed as well. So clear everything except for SSH and standard system utilities. Click on continue. And it'll start downloading and installing files at that point. Are there any questions? Jared, how's it going?
I restarted the install on a clean, like I rebooted, restarted the install on a clean thing, and it's still the same error right at the end where it's saying like failure trying to run ch root slash okay. target Did DKP, you install the software pack that install. Jeremy yeah, and then it just keeps erroring after that point. All right, we'll take that offline. Follow along with us. We'll take that offline. Yes, if sir. Can't figure it out. When's the um, what version of VirtualBox do you have installed? And Jeremy, what version do you have installed? The latest. Uh, let me see which one it actually shows up as. Latest version. So you both have the latest version. I have six. The latest one. version. Okay. We'll uh, we'll take that offline, Jared. We'll see if we can't sort it out. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, we'll 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 figure something out. Okay. Now, if you've got a solid state drive, this process goes a lot quicker. Um, it's not that big of an install, so it shouldn't matter one way or the other, but at some point you're going to get this. Now, go back to your semester one course on information systems, and can anybody tell me what the three components are necessary to boot a computer in the PC world? Anybody remember what they are? It's all related, guys. It's all related. Go ahead, Jeremy. No, not quite. Press the power button. Uh, Kernel. BIOS Very good. And, uh, yeah, boot BIOS record, and boot I can't loader, the third which one has is. a boot record, but a boot loader BIOS or something. and some kind of a kernel or the actual operating system. Okay, we've got a BIOS set up in the virtual environment. We just installed the operating system, the middle piece the piece that the BIOS calls after it's done its initialization is the bootloader and that's what we need to install. The bootloader is always required when you're setting up an operating system in the PC world. All right, Other environments don't necessarily use that but in the PC world you have a BIOS or a BIOS enhancement called UEFI or EFI but I think those are all basically gone now and they're all UEFI. You need a bootloader in this case we're going to use Grub in the Windows world, it's Windows boot, or whatever they're calling it now. But you need something to actually load the operating system and pass any parameters and do any possible maintenance at that point. So we definitely need the Grub bootloader at this point. So we say yes and continue. And because again, we are going to change the hardware. All right. If we were installing this alongside of Windows, we would effectively blow away the Windows bootloader at this point. So Debian is saying, hey, are you sure you want to do this? And because you have to specify the device you want to boot to. So select the only other option other than enter device manually and click on continue. It will go through, it will install the bootloader for our virtual hard disk. It will go through and clean up some of the files from the installation. It'll set some stuff up and then you can click on continue and it'll allow you to reboot into your freshly installed Debian. You can hit enter and you can log in. You can log in as a regular user and that is fine, or you can log in as root. Uh, 